All right, people. Nobody said they wanted an ASMR episode by the time I finished making this video, so I guess I'm narrating this one. This is the state of the head after a vigorous drubbing with the 180 grit. Get an impressionist kind of idea of what the surface looks like right here because I got some 220 grit right here and I need to use up the rest of my elbow grease before it expires. This series documents the work involved to create a show quality finish on this cast aluminum cylinder head so that anyone considering doing this job will know what to expect. That's the good news. The bad news is you're not going to see much difference in the process here on step three as you did in step two. You're just going to see a difference in the attack and what happens on the surface of the aluminum. If you did step one and two right, the Gumby effect should be gone by the time you begin step three. You've got flat, straight surfaces to work with. A little bit more planing will occur because of the grain crossing techniques, but that's just enough to keep it straight as you proceed through the later steps. You can still cross plane it here with the same grit to flatten it out if it's not quite right. But if you can see it and you haven't started on step three on this side yet, well then go back and do it with 180 grit instead. Save yourself a few hours. The reason why is because 220 grit is where you should dig out all of the fine details and transitions. Again, really, but it's where you define the shape of all the flat areas coming together. It's where you start to establish a smoother texture instead of a rough, hewn, scratched up looking surface. And you'll watch the shine and color of the aluminum start to pop out more by the time you've finished. You'll start seeing reflections. This is a fun cut if you've been waiting for something to start looking different than just a scratched up hunk of metal. You learned how to follow the light in step two, and this one, you're going to use the light to fix every edge of every intersecting angle and make all that stuff straight. Every flat face, no matter how big or small, gets sanded, but so do the corners and the edges wherever they meet. As always, any Swiss cheese holes, fish eyes, or imperfections in these areas that you leave behind after this cut, they're going to be in your final finish. The ones that you spot you can usually take out with some extra elbow grease, but the ones you leave become a feature of your part's personality. It's character. Make it shine is all. 220 grit is the beginning of the medium grit so far as I'm concerned. A carpenter would disagree with me, but this is aluminum, not wood. 220 grit brings out a surface that actually feels soft, at least it does to me. The brush look starts to soften up at the very least. You still establish the same linear texture and colors on the surface. When you think that you're done, go back and clean up anything that looks lighter than the stuff around it, because that lightness is actually roughness. The finer the sandpaper gets, the more time and effort you want to spend digging out all the edges and the corners. Go light on all that stuff at first. This is the stage where you've got that turned up to 100% though, and there's no more saving anything for later either. Every surface you're going to try to polish needs to be touched by the 220 grit. So look at it and attack it from different angles, because the change in lighting as you turn the part will reveal all. There's a few Swiss cheese holes around the exhaust flange in this casting that I can't do a whole lot about without really distorting the shape of the flange, so I'm leaving them there. But otherwise, you can see how I've dug out all the corners evenly all the way around that flange. The flange is something that I saved for after the scale layer cut, until now, because I wanted to leave as much meat as I can here. I like how this one's turning out, and this is really going to pop after step four. I'm still keeping things nice and flat. I left a good uniform texture, and the colors are even. I made it all the way through the previous cut so that no horizontal lines are showing through, but it's right about this time that I can't help but notice that I'm not moving any faster at all than I did in step two. That twice as fast per grit thing is something that I obviously failed to remember correctly about this job, but now I remember why. It's because crossing the grit with the same grit is what takes half as long. As I worked through this cut, it became painfully obvious to me that the first cut with the next grit, yeah, it seems to take exactly as long as the previous one, so sorry if you were looking forward to that. I know I was, but thanks to the magic of movies, we'll know exactly how long each one of these steps takes by the time we're finished. And of course, in a teeny tiny small fragment of a fraction of a percentage of the time that it's taking for me to do this job. Did I mention that I never wanted to do this again? I did? In every single video so far? Oh, okay, cool. Well, flipping the head over makes all the undersides of the things really easy to reach. Plus, pushing down is easier than every other direction because, you know, gravity and mass. 
This is the most absurdly detailed side, so use every advantage available to you. I know that shiny things are less fashionable these days than they used to be, but I appreciate them no less, and I suppose I'll always appreciate them, you know? The less popular polished engines are, and polished parts in general, well, then the more unique mine will become by default. Whenever you're tackling this job, be really careful sanding around your D. Take your time because one slip cutting here and you could disfigure it forever. You just want to make it smooth right up to the D. Also, you saw me make one of these in the last video. You want to be extra doubly careful whenever you're sanding inside your D hole. Don't be aggressive here, be really gentle. You actually get more room to work inside your D hole than any of the other letters found on the head. You can pretty easily get up into the outside edges of those, but getting into their holes or between them going in is going to require some magic or some kind of jeweler scribes or files that I don't have any idea about. I tried to do those with my G6K head and I smurfed a few letters and I'm going to try to rely on the polishing wheel to do whatever it does here, leaving them alone. I know that the pain and suffering that I experience, accelerated to 25,000% plus, has and will be shared by many others in real time. I commend all of them. They understand how 99% of this job feels just like the fishing part without all the catching. They'll know that it's a job that lasts longer than both phases of their employee review process. Three holidays, a tax season, their home appraisal and refinancing of their house, a cold or two, a business deal, an oil change, a dentist appointment, and yet still here we are, only on step three. The time you spend doing this has to fit inside of all of your other life's priorities. And I promise you this job will still be waiting for you to spend another hundred hours more on once you finish dealing with all that stuff. You'll do a better job on this if you win at all that other stuff along the way. Don't pretend that you can just sit here for 200 hours straight. You can't. There is no hurry up and finish if you want quality. I know that later in life, when I'm looking back at this series, I'll be proud of it, and I'll be forcibly telling myself all the way through the end of this until I believe it, because it's just an absurdly ridiculous amount of video to process, but perhaps this treatment will become popular again. Maybe I'll get lucky and millions of people tune into this series. If so, I gratefully welcome all of you here. But with a finite number of gas-burning cars scheduled to be built, and half of those sitting still on halted production lines, I'd be surprised. It's been over 100 hours since we first started Step 1, but with two sides of the head completed, we're 22 hours and 10 minutes from where Step 3 started. It's taken just as long. Mm-hmm. Yep. Actually, a little longer, I think. Anyway, I'm just going to shut up and let you get a good look at the state of things everywhere I've been. And now for the intake side of things again. The dreaded intake side. This one's texture is cocked over 90 degrees from the other sides because we planed it twice in step two. It had a powerful Gumby effect going on that we put a stop to. The texture mismatch on the corner will be a little weird until we fix it, but eh, not that big of a deal because intake side also it's gonna easily blend later and I'm planning some trickery in step four that should take care of it. I figured I'd go left to right this time to make things interesting. Doubling up your detail efforts definitely slows you down. You can't just mow the lawn here, you have to do all the edging and weed whacking as you go along too. You'll even see me come back and revisit a lot of spots as I work because the light catches something wrong, or more likely because I just forgot something along the way. Yeah, that focus thing I was talking about in the last video? Mm hmm. Just one more of the multitudes of reasons why you do the whole thing in one direction. You don't get lost. My method for all of this that I'm sharing with you is how I take the pressure and the thought process right out of doing this. Because there really doesn't ever need to be any. <laughs> if you understand the time commitment, you understand the surface changes, you understand the materials and the techniques to knocking it all down and how to recognize it, well then there's nothing else complicated about any of it. 
It's just a matter of putting in the time and mindlessly doing the work. It's just sitting through it. I say mindlessly, but really, all you have to do with your brain is check in with your eyes once in a while to ensure everything looks right. Maybe do recon around where you were working to make sure you're, you know, on the right path. It's so easy that you can decide just with your eyes. You really don't need the brain. All right, maybe just flip that one brain cell from a zero to one. That's it. Other than that one brain cell, go ahead and let it wonder. If you've handled your business everywhere else in your life already, then this should never be anything other than a relaxing escape into productivity. I've been accused of cavemaning this job. Thank you, brother. That's a huge compliment. The hard way has its benefits. I'll put my results up against anyone who didn't use a 5-axis CNC. Here we are, about six hours into the intake side. You can see that I've managed to get the whole top row of stuff above the intake cam oil supply that runs the length of the head there. When you have to sand this part horizontally, it's just so much protruding things poking out at you that you're interrupted everywhere you go. And this took about two hours longer to do one pass on that you know, then I did in step two because of it. There's a whole lot of detail work here, but it looks great. When we do the vertical cut in step four, it's going to look amazing. This is the stage where we sand unusually complicated things in unusually hidden places that will be unusually difficult to polish later on down the road. I twisted up a few more sandpaper rolls for the detail work and did the acrobatics necessary, but having to use the detail tools to do large surface areas just so that you can access everything evenly means that you're burning up that clock really bad now. Slow rolling. So I threw a few more fuel rods into the video accelerator. I've built a weakness into this one so that I could be defeated one day. I sadly never managed to compete with my mentor in King of Bling predecessor's original car. The club dissolved while I held the title, so we both remained undefeated. It was always a friendly competition, so it's impossible for me to be any happier with where we left it all or with the cars that it produced, and about all the awesome people that it brought together year after year. And that's all that it's really all about, isn't it? Because as I mentioned in the opener, you're doing this for other people. So I will caveman this job for all of you on video and show you everything I know about why. It's kind of my thing, and this time it gets to be about my other kind of thing. This whole polishing thing is actually what got me into engine modification in the first place. The polished street strip car that goes to shows is just the perfect excuse to go all in, right? Just understand that whatever you're polishing isn't going to last you forever. And if you're pushing the limits of a thing that eats cylinder heads at every other pass, then this isn't for you at all. If you polish a fast thing, it's a sacrifice to the gods of speed. It's the slow polished cars that actually hold the most value and tend to stand the test of time. They're the ones that seem to inherit the earth. You can tell I'm at the end of this because I'm all over the place, back here on a different side and flipping the head all over the place looking for anything that I missed or can blend better. Hold on. Technical difficulties. This battery just doesn't want to stay put, does it? Not cool. That clip was 15 minutes and I'm putting that time back on it. So, now where was I? There's one area on the thermostat side where I didn't like what I saw. Must have done a poor job on an earlier step, whatever. I just cross-planed that two more times to cut it deeper and straighten the grain back out. And it looks just like everything else around it now. Mostly. Really, it doesn't matter. There's going to be a thermostat housing bolted right over top of it anyway. Looks great, though. Can you visually see what I mean by the surface becomes soft? It looks soft. It feels smooth. I called this the smoothing cut in step two. And really, it's only fair to call this here right now in step three, the smoothing cut once you're at the end of it. Step four is yet another smoothing cut, but it's the last one before the process substantially changes and visually even more impacting than what you just saw happen here. The exhaust side is still beautiful and straight with no horizontal lines that aren't reflections in the surface. This is a perfect jumping off point from step three, the first of two smoothing cuts. Where are we at on time? We spent 13 hours on the intake side and cleanup. Great. Well, that puts us at 35 hours on this job. Just a bit shy, but I rounded the half hour off of step two, so 35 hours is fair. 35 hours. 88 plus 36, we're, we're at 124 hours of work to get here. Just think, after step four, we're halfway there. Stay tubed. One more thing before I go, though. 
for those of you curious about the nerdy aspect of producing this, I'm working on a 4 terabyte SSD that I had to empty four times as I processed dozens of full 64 gig memory cards, down to a respectable pre-accelerated file size of only 2 gigabytes. Then I dropped each one of those 2 gigabyte files into the master project, numbered in order of course, and you can see here in step 3 I shot 61 memory cards to cover a 35 hour job. Only 9 voiceover tracks this time because the video is shorter. Each one of these clips down here on the bottom is a whole memory card. Some of those 27 and a half minute 4K memory cards only last six and a half seconds fully processed in the timeline before slamming into the next full six second memory card. What I would do to actually be able to work that fast. I mean, this kind of makes audio tracks a nightmare, but I believe I got it pretty good this time. Let's look at the previous video, step two. You can see I shot 65 memory cards to cover a 36 and a half hour video. Another 10 terabytes of video processed into a whole movie that was twice as long because I had twice as much info to cover. I'm not going to skimp or exaggerate this series. I'm going to bring it all to you. You can tell that this is step two because there's a Patreon end screen right here and there isn't on this video. These guys are truly my heroes. They're the ones who helped me put together my production in a way that handles gigantic video files efficiently enough to shoot videos like this. The odd numbered episodes are unsponsored, but I'm still going to give them a shout out anyway because they've positioned me in a way where I really get to kick this project up to the next level and challenge myself like never before. I had to break these videos up into multiple parts because even these have become too unwieldy to produce and my equipment's great, so... That, you know, I hope you enjoy these focused episodes this round, and no matter how long these take me to create, I'll do my best to condense each video to a length appropriate to just give you what you need, and to show you that the work is getting done. Thanks for watching, click all the things because I go broke when you don't, and stay tuned for real this time.